We thank you, most glorious holy God, that you have revealed your glory to us in your Son, Jesus, and that through him we have access to your glory. We pray that you will give us the grace to be beggars before you, to seek all that we need from you, and to join with the angels in glorifying you, now and always. Amen. If you open your hymn books to page 7 and 8, you'll find that uh, after the confession of sins, we have three units. Three units which are part of the preparatory rite, the rite by which we uh, come into God's presence, uh, the entrance rite. It looks like this. You have the invocation, very simple but very profound the rite of absolution. And then, uh, that's the preparatory rite, then we have the entrance rite, the coming, accessing God, coming to God's presence. There's the introit, or you can have, which comes from a psalm, or more of a psalm, or the whole psalm with doxology. There's the curia, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy in that or in more expanded forms and then you get the angelic hymn glory to God in the highest now let me give you the big picture first of all and then we'll home in on those aspects you're familiar with them the one part uh, which is very often absent these days is the intro it uh, uh, I'll <coughs> comment on that now uh, what the function of this part of the service is for us to approach God in order to receive grace, blessing from Him. And it answers the question, how do we access God's grace? What kind of people are we, do we need to be, become, if we want to access God's grace? Well, this is the final result of it. Um, holiness is something that comes as a result of it. But in practical terms, um, uh, we need to be purified. Um, and that's uh, 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 very clearly part of this here. Number one, how do we access God? By invoking his name. For pagan people, idols gave them access to their gods. God gives us his name, Yahweh in the Old Testament, Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the New Testament, his personal names, so that we can access his grace, so that we can access him. Um, very, very important and something that's been forgotten very much in modern uh, uh, church, where there's a great reluctance to name God and there's good uh, reasons of political correctness not to name God because you want to be inclusive, you don't want to exclude anybody. But as soon as you say the name Jesus, you exclude everybody almost, <laughs> except Christians. So, uh, how do we access God? By invoking his name. Secondly, by being baptized. And if we are baptized, then by receiving absolution, forgiveness of sins. That's the cleansing rite. Before you can be clean, now before you can come into God's presence, uh, you need to be cleansed of sin because an unclean person, a person with an unclean conscience, cannot approach God without coming under God's judgment, God's <coughs> wrath. Uh, so the first thing that needs to be done is cleansing. Uh, Remember that there's a very close connection theologically between baptism and absolution. If you like, absolution is an appropriation, ongoing appropriation of baptism. Thirdly, 
we approach as people of faith. Since we have been baptised, we are people who have been given the gift of faith and we come into God's presence with prayer and praise. That's the basic stance. Prayer because we have nothing to offer God himself. We have everything to receive. Now that's going to be dramatised in another way, very dramatically. Praise uh, because uh, all the good things that we have come from God. And the focus in worship must be on God and God's goodness. When you praise somebody, you focus not on their faults, but on their goodness. God alone is worthy of praise because God alone is truly, utterly, entirely good. Uh, fourthly, we, the stance that we have to adopt, or that we need to adopt if we're going to receive, is that we come with empty hands. The picture is that we come as beggars with nothing to give and everything to receive. Uh, lastly, even though we're beggars and we have nothing of ourselves, our status is that we join together with the angels in the presence of God, heaven here on earth. And we perform doxology together with the angels. During Lent, the uh, glory to... The greater glory is omitted, but not the minor doxology. Can you, I'll, I'll explain that. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain that. Okay. Um, uh, you have a uh, glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is is here at the end of the intro. Um, in fact, um, in the uh, some original services. Uh, the service doesn't begin up here, but the service begins here with psalm verses leading to doxology. The doxology is the invocation of the triune God. That's the big picture. Okay? Now can you see, you, you always, to make sense of what's going on in the service, um, it's not enough just to have theology, a general theology. What's the meaning of this? The meaning of this you can't unpack. The whole Bible is the meaning of this. But you can um, understand what the function is. What's the function of confession and absolution is to receive an absolution from the triune God. What's the function of the invocation? Is to access God and his grace. What's the function of the introit? Is to use the words that God himself has given, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to pray and praise. What's the function of the uh, Lord have mercy, it's to approach God in the stance of a beggar. What's the function of doxology is that we, even though we're beggars, on the one hand, we have angelic status. We join with the angels in approaching God. Okay, let's have a look at these three things in turn. The intro, the curia, and then the whole question of doxology. I've given you an essay that I've written on the mystery of doxology. Could you please read it? Um, after we've had the class today, I don't know how far we'll get. It'll probably, you might have a bit of uh, heavy going before then. Um, but it's one aspect of worship which has always been very important until modern times. Let's have a look first at the intro. It. Um, let me just show you the way, if you go to liturgic books, this is the way it's set down. Okay, you get all the propers here for a particular Sunday in an old book, that's LCA book. Notice you get, what propers? Intro it, here, collect, prayer of the day, readings. Of course it's a propers. Now, Traditionally speaking, every Sunday had its intro. Intro is psalm verses, and intro it means from, in Latin, he enters. And they were psalm verses that were sung as the priest, the liturgist, entered the church. So they weren't spoken or sung traditionally by the pastor, the priest, but they were sung by somebody else, either the congregation or a cantor, a singer, or a choir as the pastor, priest, entered the service. Um, and uh, the intro, it comes from the psalm set for the day. So traditionally speaking, the first Sunday in Lent, 
uh, the psalm set for that in the one-year lectionary, Psalm 91, and the intro it is some verses taken from that psalm. So it's, it, it gets the guts of the psalm, um, and it consists of two parts. There is the psalm itself, and then the, the antiphon. The antiphon is the congregational part. The psalm is the part that's sung by the choir or the lead singer. This is what the congregation then says. But they're usually uh, three verses from a psalm, very short. And the, the, their practical function is, they're short because it's something that needs to be done as the pastor enters the church and goes to the altar uh, where he can, he can then say, Lord have mercy. Okay, so you, uh, uh, it's short to cover that period of entry. Okay, in, in traditional services, this is where the service started. There was no invocation. There was no confession and absolution because it's private confession and absolution. The glory to the Father at the end of the in, 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 intro is the invocation. Okay? Uh, that's in the old Latin mass. You'll find it. Let's have a look at the intro it. And then a few things about the use of psalmody in worship. First of all, just the intro. Um, the origin is indicated by the name introit in Latin means he enters. He comes in. He, the priest, enters. Uh, originally, this was at the, in the old Latin mass, going right back to 3rd, 4th century, very ancient. It was the point in which the priest would enter the church at the beginning of the service. Um, but at the present time, it comes later. We've had the pastor coming in. We've had the invocation. We've had the rite of confession and absolution. So it's become to some extent dysfunctional. It no longer serves its original function. And if you like, it is the movement, usually, not of the, the, pa the pastor into the church, but the movement of the pastor from the nave into the sanctuary. And that movement, then, of the congregation into the sanctuary. So the pastor leads the people, then, into the sanctuary, um, where they say the curie. They come into God's presence as beggars. So it's that entrance right. Uh, the nature, we have selected verses from the psalm for the day, and that leads to the so-called lesser doxology. You have the greater doxology, glory to God in the highest, and the lesser doxology, which is glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Two things. Um, uh, you have the following structure. Um, classically, if you sang the whole psalm, you'd sing the antiphon first, then you'd have the verse, then you'd have uh, uh, the doxology, glory to the Father, and then you'd have the antiphon, again, if it was sung. Now, since that doesn't happen very much now anymore, I won't spend a lot of time in this. That, that reflects ancient usage. Um, uh, we don't usually do it that way. If we, if we use it, we use it as a whole. There's no distinction between the verse and the antiphon. But if you look at old musical settings, for example, Harry, you'll see that this is, you have classical books of songs, sung antiphons that you're probably familiar with. Um, now, uh, uh, what is it, what does, uh, what's the form of this particular part of the service? It's a psalm verse that's either one of two things, it's either prayer addressed to God or praise spoken to each other and the world. So it's either prayer or praise. And in a practical sense, it affects whether you stand and you face the altar, yes. or whether you can sit down during the psalm. Yes, whether you face the altar or face the congregation, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. Um, okay. But basically, it's prayer and or praise, or some cases it's both prayer and praise. Uh, uh, look at this here. What is this one? It's uh, something slightly different here is a confession of faith. This is praise. Um, you could say this is a, a, a confession of faith, but it's praise more generally. It's a promise, um, but it's praise. 
Uh, you have other ones which are basically prayer ones. Let me see if I've got one here for you. Um, notice that this is a combination of both praise and prayer. The Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. To you be the glory, O Lord, for your loving kindness and your great mercy turn to me. Prayer. And then, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God on his holy mountain. Uh, you see? The psalm this week is prayer. Okay? Prayer or praise, basically, uh, generally. Uh, yeah. Its present function, not its original function in the old Latin Mass, the present function is uh, uh, our entry, the entry of the congregation, the people of God into God's presence with prayer and praise. Prayer and praise are in uh, confessed faith. Uh, how do you enact faith? By praying and praising God. So it's entry into God's presence with confessing our faith. And it introduces uh, the uh, great glory uh, in which we proclaim and adore the triune God. So we pray, we praise God, and we end up then adoring the triune God. So petition, uh, praise, thanksgiving, adoration. That's the particular movement uh, in this first part of the service. Now, if you do use it, and it's optional, um, there's a whole number of different ways of doing it, practically speaking. Um, if you, and you have an option, uh, you, know, you have three options here, quite practically. Number one, you can use the traditional introits. Number two, you can use the whole psalm that's sent, set for the uh, week, or um, some part of the psalm set for the week, and you'll find worship resources say, you know, you can use this whole psalm, or you can use various parts of the psalm, some as an intro and some as a gradual between Old Testament and New Testament. So the various options are given to you. Thirdly, uh, you can replace it w uh, uh, by a paraphrase of the psalm, which is a hymnic version, which can therefore be sung rather than spoken. Or fourthly, you can omit it altogether. And because it ceased to be strictly functional, um, most pastors these days omit it. Okay, that's always an option. Um, now, uh, just if we do it that way, if you use the intro, it can be spoken by the pastor as he enters the congregation. It can be sung responsively. That's pastor one verse or half verse, uh, congregation half verse spoken or sung responsively by the pastor with the congregation that's spoken or it can be sung and this is the best way if you have these uh, intros uh, it's best if you have a lead singer a cantor singing it or your choir singing it that's the intro it's um, secondly you can use the whole psalm that's sent for this the weeks this week we have psalm 25 and we've been using um, that singing, yes, 1 to 15 in chapel. Uh, the psalm could be spoken responsively, half verse, half verse, uh, or antiphonally, verse by verse, between pastor and congregation. Now, that doesn't work very well, really, because uh, psalms are meant to be sung. It's like speaking a, a hymn rather than singing it. Um, if possible, sing it. So, and there are uh, three options of sing ways of singing it. First of all, the whole psalm can be sung by the congregation. If any of you happen to go to North America, all the Lutheran churches that I know there regularly sing the psalm, the congregation do, because there's five or six tones, Harry? Six, six tones. tones, six tunes that are used for the whole year, for all the psalms. 
and you get to know them backwards and this, the congregation sing these psalms magnificently. So psalm singing has once again been revived there. So the congregation sings the whole psalm. And once people have learnt it, it's very easy to sing. I've never been to one where it's been read. I'm not in, I've, I've never been to one in North America where it's read. It's always sung. Uh, it's only here in Australia that I've seen that done. Uh, secondly, so it can be sung by the whole congregation, or this whole psalm can be sang, sung by a cantor or the choir, or what I think works best is to be sung uh, by a cantor or choir with a congregational antiphon, the way we do it in chapel. Now, what's the advantage of, say, a cantor or choir singing the main part of it, like Dr. Pfeiffer did this morning, and the congregation just joining in with the chorus verse, the antiphon verse? Everyone knows a the tune. There's some other spin-offs. You can hear what's being said. As soon as sung, it's, it's, it's very, very clear. So you meditate on it by hearing it being sung. Also the difficulty of, of the verses because the words change. Yes. Because there's no regular meter, it's very difficult to fit the tune in with the words, but the tune fits very clearly into the antiphon. The, ante the, the musical setting fits those words, the rhythm of those words. Now, um, have any of you noticed what happens if we sing a psalm, the same sung psalm, about three or four times a week? It comes in your brain box. You just walk around with it during the... Okay, it sings itself into your mind. And uh, you don't ha decide to meditate on it. It meditates itself. You know the way music hooks in? It's to use that device so that the Word of God, the work of the psalm, actually is hooked into your mind and it sings in your heart. I find that I wake up at night time and up here I'm singing the antiphon after singing it three or four times. But if it's a good tune, that hooks in. Um, it's, it's a meditative device. It helps you to meditate on the psalms and to pray the psalms not with your head and not with your voice but you with your heart and it engages your heart in meditation and it helps you to carry that psalm into your daily life um, okay that's I you know if I had to give any option that would be my pre preferred option and that's what the LCA worship resources give you um, and uh, Settings for every psalm that's set for the three electionary um, that can be sung by a cantor or choir with a congregational antiphon. Um, you can replace it, as I say, by the paraphrase of a psalm. Most psalms have been um, you know, recast in metric form uh, or it can be omitted altogether. Which brings me to the question, a broader question, what's the function of psalmody? Why sing psalms in the divine service? They were sung. Hmm? They were sung. Number one, the psalms were sung where? At the temple, and then once the temple was destroyed, in the synagogue, and right from the beginning in the church, the church, you realize, for until the time of the Reformation, the church didn't have any hymn book. What was the hymn book of the church? Psalms. The Psalms are the hymn book of both Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God. And they are special. What's the difference between the Psalms and the songs you'll find here and the songs you'll find in the Altogether Connection? They're directly scriptural. They are directly scriptural, therefore they are what? They are, they are Word of God, they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they are Word of God. They have a special status. They have a spiritual power. They are living in a way that no human paraphrase of the Word of God is. But mind you, all, all hymns should be scriptural. And only if they're scriptural are they allowed to be sung in the church. Uh, but uh, they are inspired Word of God. And uh, Okay?
And when we sing the Psalms, we perform praise together with who? David, who is the head of the choir. He appointed the Levitical choir to sing the Psalms on his behalf. And the people appointed David to sing Psalms for them. So uh, we sing together with who when we sing the Psalms? King David, the people of Israel, and in all the Psalms you get the Israelites calling on the nations to join them in praising God. So we join David and Israel and all nations on earth in praising God. It's a really ecumenical act uh, in a very, very profound way. It's one, one very important thing that links us with uh, the people of God at all times and all places. However, there's still another very significant, important element in singing psalms. Let's have a look at two mysterious passages in the New Testament. First of all, Colossians chapter 3, 16 to 17. Greg, are you struggling today? I can see it. Are you struggling, are you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, if you have to stand or do anything, uh, I don't know. Do you mind reading? Uh, despite your struggling, maybe it'll help you to focus. Colossians 3, 16 to 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, notice the structure here. Let the word of Christ, the gospel, dwell richly in you. And if you, the word of Christ, if Christ and his word of grace dwells in your hearts, what will that word produce? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So the word of God that's spoken to you, the word of Christ, becomes the word of God in you, spoken back in thanksgiving and praise to God the Father. Uh, even more profoundly than that, can we go to Hebrews chapter 2, 11 to 12? And you need to know that... Uh, in verse 12, we have a quotation from Psalm 18. The speaker in Psalm 18 is the king, David, but it's one of the messianic psalms. It's one of the royal psalms, the Davidic psalms, royal psalms, messianic psalms. Okay, can you uh, read first of all verse 11, please, Jade? Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Just stop there. Who is the one who makes all of us holy? Well, the Holy Spirit. No, it's not reference. Jesus does. Jesus is our high priest. He's the one who makes us holy. And who are the ones who are made holy by Jesus? Those who have faith in him. They are brothers. Now that doesn't just mean that they are normal brothers, but since he is a priest, then what's their status? They're not just brother, but they are brother priests, together with Jesus. They've joined his priesthood. They've joined the priestly fraternity, a holy priesthood, a holy brotherhood, together with Jesus. Now, what do they uh, do then as brothers together with Christ, as holy brothers together with Christ? So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And now, yeah, that's as far as I want you to go. Who are my brothers there? Is the congregation, the church, the ecclesia. Who is the I that's speaking here? Jesus. Jesus is speaking. Now, what does Jesus do? in the congregation, in the church? Jade? He leads us in doing what? Praise. Praising whose name? God. The name of God the Father. So, who is the praise leader in the church? Jesus is. Uh, who is the lead singer in the church? Jesus. 
And why does Jesus give us his word? So that we can join him in praising God the Father. Remember, he says, let, Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, so that what? You'll sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace, gratitude in your hearts to God the Father. Words that please God the Father. They are the words that please God the Father, that are, are the words that Jesus gives us. We also have in the last chapter after singing hymns and songs. Have what? There. In, in the last supper? Yes. After him. Um, he, hymns and songs. Yes, then they go out into there. Jesus uh, sings, and, and there's a very significant part of the Psalter that he sings, which is the Egyptian Halal, Psalm 113 to 118. It's the last praises that Jesus sung together with his disciples before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Egyptian Halal, 113 to 118. Uh, so we perform prayer and praise together with Jesus. Now, Jesus is the Messiah, so when we sing the Psalms, we're singing together with David, but we're also singing together with Jesus. So uh, Psalms are praise and prayer together with Jesus. They have exactly the same status as the Lord's Prayer. Do you realize the Lord's Prayer is not just the prayer that Jesus taught us, but it's the prayer that Jesus prays for us and we pray together with Him. Who alone can address God as Father? Jesus. So when we are praying the Lord's Prayer, we are dressing up as Jesus. We're impersonating Jesus. We're standing in his shoes. We are praying not just through through Jesus, but we're praying together with Jesus. Yes, we're little Christ. You know, we are his brothers. Um, we stand together with him before the Father. So by singing psalms, we sing together with David, together with Israel, together with the whole church, but most importantly, we sing together with Jesus. And that kind of praise is pleasing to God. Now if we want to know what kind of praise singing pleases God, this is the best you could possibly get. There's one further dimension to psalm singing that Paul touches on in Ephesians chapter 5, 18 to 20. Tim, could you please read that? Better read from verse 16 through verse 20. making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in the heart, in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to the Lord, to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a number of features here. First of all, you get a strange passive imperative. Usually an imperative tells you what to do. A passive imperative tells you not what to do. No. No. What's going to be done to you? It's to receive something that's done to you. So be filled with the Spirit means let yourself be filled with the Spirit. So receive the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, it's interesting here, the uh, imperative that's used is that you're not just filled with the Spirit once, but this is an ongoing thing. What happens if you are filled with the Spirit? Then what will you do? And um, the, the, the Greek actually doesn't put a full stop there. It says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing ma and making music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything or in everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are filled with the Spirit, what will happen? You'll sing, songs. You'll sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You'll sing praise, praises. Okay, what's the mark of being filled with the Spirit? Not speaking in tongues, but singing. singing. Not singing anything. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 
To who? To God the Father in the name of Jesus. Notice that Trinitarian dynamic. If you're filled with the Spirit, what will the Spirit do? It will inspire your lips to sing personal praise, congregational praise, devotional praise in your heart. Notice those three dimensions. To God the Father, not to anybody else, but to God the Father, together with Jesus, through Jesus. Well, it's kind of a circuit, yes. Uh, you're joining in the conversation. Um, the dialogue between the Father and the Son, you're joining in that. Now, it works in two ways. If you're filled with the Spirit, you'll do this. But what happens as you do this? You're being filled with the Spirit. So, if somebody wants to come to me and says, OK, I want to be filled with the Spirit, how do I do it? I'd say, come to church. Um, hear the Word of God, receive the sacrament, but also join with in the church in singing what? Not any praise songs, but psalms and hymns and spirit-produced songs. Notice how psalm singing sits in there. So uh, uh, we pro when we sing psalms, we perform the praises that are produced by the Holy Spirit and that bring the Spirit into our praises. Now, um, one of the most interesting features that uh, I've noticed in my lifetime, talking as an old man now, is, uh, and it's some, the most interesting things are always the things that happen not just locally, which is always very interesting, but ecumenically. Um, back in the 50s, when I grew up, there was hardly any singing of psalms anywhere in any denomination here in Australia. Or anywhere else. That was still there in fossilized form. You had the intro, it's, you had Anglican chant, which is used by the Anglicans and some Lutherans. We had it in front of our hymn book, the black hymn book. You see all those settings of psalms, but in practice, very few people used it. And that was the, what was happening across all the churches. But one of the things that's happened ecumenically across a right range of denominations, from Catholic through to Pentecostal is singing of psalms. Many new ways, but in fact most of the new ways of singing psalms are old ways of singing psalms that have been rediscovered. The Sons uh, of Korah is very... Sons of Korah, for example, is... But that, that merely the, uh, the, t the, the, the top here in Australia. But uh, Christopher Wilcox and Catholic Church, um, you get those uh, Lutheran Book of Worship uh, uh, singing... LBW, you, you just get a whole range of different ones. Psalm singing. Why is it that psalm singing has been revived in the church? Psalm singing is better than Psalm singing is better indeed. It's no singing. It's the spirit who's at work through the word. Um, but the important thing is the that Trinitarian dynamic. It's not any, it's not any praise. But it's praise that is, comes, is inspired by the Holy Spirit through the words of Jesus, which then bring the Holy Spirit to people's hearts, and that Holy Spirit produces praise singing together with Jesus to God the Father. So it's that Trinitarian praise that's the important thing. Now, you'll find uh, as we go through the liturgy, and I won't spend a lot of time, but a large part of classical liturgies consists of passages from Scripture, and what part of Scripture is used most of all in the liturgy? Psalms. Can you see why? If you have a choice between using human words in some part and psalm verses, what are you always going to use? Psalm verses. Um, and you can see why this is part of our traditional pattern of worship. Any questions on that? Now, it won't be easy, um, and you'll have to work with what's given. Uh, particularly if you want to revive psalm singing, which is not just paraphrased psalms, you know, metrical paraphrased psalms. The simplest way is to get uh, uh, people who are good singers to act as cantors. Um, this is your original lead singer. Um, and most congregations have good singers 
Well, it's very difficult to get a choir going these days in most congregations, but most congregations do have people who are good singers who are quite happy if they're given half a chance to do this. Um, look, we even get it happening in our community, and we never have any shortage. We've never had any shortage of cantors here as long as I've been here. Let's have a break now, and then I'll deal with the curie and begin work on the doxology.